My name is uh, Sam Conti, and uh, I'm a uh, mechanical engineer. I'm a graduate of uh, now Trine University, but when I went to it, it was Tri-State College. And I went to Tri-State College in Angola, Indiana from 1957 to 1959. Actually, I was supposed to graduate in 58, but I had to take an extra, I wanted to take an extra course, extra courses and an extra semester so that I could have aeronautical engineering as a, as a minor. My uh, major was uh, tool design and uh, I'll get into why for that. That worked out much to my surprise to, uh, uh, to my career. First of all, I'm here to talk about my involvement with the rocket industry and the more so, uh, more specifically, to the U.S. space program. Uh, and my involvement is 1959, April of 59, to basically September 1968 with two different companies. Now, before any of you think I'm a rocket scientist, let me correct that. I am not. Uh, it was all I could do to graduate with a BS degree from Tri-State. More so, there was 152 in my graduating class. I was number 151, and number 152 wouldn't give up that last seat. But amazingly enough, my first job was a dream job that I'm sure God in some way, in a great way, uh, had a lot to do with that. So let me tell you about the start of it. First of all, I said 1959. You have to remember that NASA w was uh, formed in 1958. Uh, President Eisenhower uh, wrote the agreement to start it. So it was one year old, in fact, a little, just a little bit less than one year old, when I went to work for what became Hercules Powder Company. Let me straighten that out. The company that I went to work for was Young Development Laboratories that nobody's ever heard of. Let me take you back to 1959. I graduated from college in uh, March of 1959 and there wasn't a job to be had, or at least darn few, because there was a recession from 58 to 1959. Most of you don't remember that. I sure do, because friends of mine that had graduated with the class in 1958 kept telling me that there just ain't no jobs out there for engineers, for anybody technical. In fact, companies were downsizing. Then they said, lay off. Okay, so I thought, well, I'm from New Jersey, and there's sure no jobs out in the Midwest that I can get. And a few times that I, in, I, uh, uh, I checked into it, there really wasn't anything in the Midwest. Uh, so I went back to my home state of New Jersey, Trenton, New Jersey, and uh, I wasn't married then, and uh, start looking. Well, I went to about five interviews, uh, or at least made five interviews, and, uh, uh, f uh, and found out that, that the one thing that was really, really killing me was my 151st out of uh, 152 graduates being second to the last, and nobody would touch me. Okay, one day there appeared in our local paper, and Trenton, New Jersey is the capital of New Jersey, so its newspaper was uh, fairly complete. It had an ad for a company in Rocky Hill, New Jersey. Now folks, Rocky Hill, New Jersey is about the size of Angola, and uh, it's a three, then a 300 year old colonial town. And it's just north of Princeton, New Jersey. And uh, 
it was for an engineer. Well, I couldn't for the life of me imagine what company was located in that small burg, but I went. And um, here in the middle of nowhere was this huge manufacturing facility still under construction, trucks going in and out, had a barbed wire fence and a chain link fence all the way around it. And I could not for the life of me fathom what could possibly be here. Well, I met my uh, uh, interviewer and we went into a building that was incomplete. That was the only place to, to, we, he could find that was for the interview. It had a dirt floor with straw on it, and I'm not kidding. The walls and the ceiling were up. They had drafting tables, a whole line of them, in that building, and with people working at them. And we were, that was on one side of the room. We were on the other side of the room getting an interview. At this point, I don't really care what they made, but if I could just get a job, get my foot in the door, that's what was important to me. All right, something else. I am basically a draftsman illustrator that had the good fortune to become an engineer. And uh, they were looking for an illustrator, engineer, designer. And uh, I was, according to them, exactly what they were looking for. My interviewer uh, said, uh, we, uh, we don't care what your uh, graduating position was in a class, you have a BS degree in mechanical engineering. I said, yes. He said, you're an, a proven illustrator. And the illustrations are, these are illustrations. All right. And, uh, he said, we will hire you and have shot me a wage. I about fell off my chair because all the time I went to school, the college, and I had uh, four, year, four and a half years of college with one year off, so a total of five and a half years. Money had never, ever been discussed. And when they shot me that wage and they were ready to hire me, I about fell off the chair. But I thought, okay, here's the golden goose. And he said, when can you start? And I said, how about this afternoon? And I, no, 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 no. But that was on, I think, a Wednesday, Tuesday or a Wednesday. And I started the coming Monday. And they were eager to get me started. Now, remember, I'm in the middle of nowhere with this huge manufacturing facility. That's like going to Angola, Angola and finding a General Motors plant under construction. Uh, relatively, that's the impression I had. I still don't know what they make, and every time I breached the subject, they would artfully dodge. And uh, they, uh, I told them I wanted to become a uh, professional engineer, and I'm perfectly willing to, uh, uh, to, to go through the uh, program in order to do that, that takes six years. And they said, well, that's good because we're gonna put you at a team of three professional engineers. And uh, that was the owner, Dick Young, a uh, pro chief project engineer, Don Ross, and the second project engineer, Bob Johnson. These people are all famous in a very small niche of the rocket business. Dick Young invented the rocket engines that we worked on and what I'm going to describe. Uh, I went to work, obviously, and uh, in the meantime, we kept shifting around as they finished, put the floors in and they put the electrics in, and uh, we kept shifting around. And finally, I got into the, uh, the main building, which was attached to the building I had interviewed in, and uh, got an L desk. Now. Prior to that, you had a separate desk, uh, metal or wood, and you had a separate drawing board. In 1959, they had invented the L desk. So you had a desk and attached to it, to your right, in the shape of an L, was your drawing board. Man, I was just in pig heaven. Now folks, what I'm gonna tell you next, you have to remember that this is 1959. 
There's three computers in the country. One of them Russia has. There are no PCs. There, they hadn't yet come up with the satellite and mainframe computers. There are no hand calculators, no electronics. So, uh, and <laughs> a lot of other things that just weren't there yet. So in all the work that I had to do, I could not produce a drawing that looked like a blueprint. That's why these are drawn cartoon style. Now these are not the drawings that I did in 1959. Had I done that, you would have been photographing this interview in a prison cell, all right? But they desperately needed some method of showing people what we do, especially the new hires. So I drew in cartoon style the drawings that you're going to see. And that was a big hit. I, when I designed something, I would make a cartoon style drawing like these and say, this is what I'm talking about. They loved it because nobody had ever done that before. They would hand, uh, hand the uh, project engineer chicken scratches or maybe take three days to make a complete blueprint only to have the chief engineer throw it away. Uh, that's not what I want. So when I made the illustration, they knew what I was talking about. Okay. All right. So here we are, Rocky Hill, New Jersey. After two weeks, they, uh, in the meantime, they kept running around talking about security clearance, security clearance. Now, folks, I'm from the first generation, full generation, born here. My heritage is Polish and Italian. When I graduated from, uh, when I was in senior year of high school, my counselor said that I should look into going into a trade because my heritage has proven that we're not college material. That's a whole nother story. So here I am in a, in a company that's making some secret device. I had no idea what security clearance was. As it turns out, it was, uh, it was highly confidential and then turned into secret. There was, and at that time, I don't think there was a top secret, at least not available to civilians. Okay, so here I am in Rocky Hill, New Jersey. The second week, they finally told me what they make. That means I never went from the main building into the factory where we made this stuff. All of our first third stage rocket engines, third stage rocket engines, were made in Rocky Hill, New Jersey. And that was part of the secret because nobody expected it to be in Rocky Hill, New Jersey. The other facilities, the rocket design group was in Wilmington, Delaware, on the, at a, the second floor, third floor of a bank building over a vault because nobody knew it was there. The rocket loading center, this drawing where we actually loaded the rockets, was in Cumberland Gap, Maryland. Okay, let's get back to Rocky Hill. We were actually making the engines out of filament wound fiberglass. This green thing is fiberglass yarn that goes through a bath of resin pictured on the left, and then as this rotates on a lathe, the shuttle carrying the resin goes back and forth and makes a three-dimensional figure eight around the shape. That is how we made the rocket engines. We actually made the machines because nobody had ever been there before. When I was briefed on the process by the owner of the company, Dick Young, who invented the filament wound fiberglass process and all those gas station tanks that you see and oxygen tanks that you see being put in the ground or carried on trucks now started in Rocky Hill, New Jersey in 1959. Now, when I was interviewed, I was in the job 
uh, not interviewed, when I was uh, briefed on the process, um, I was with the company maybe two weeks. And I'm still in La La Land. Thrilled that I got a job. I don't have the slightest idea what I'm doing. And I could not take notes because Dick Young, the, en the engineer, owner, inventor, owned the patents. And we couldn't take notes or anything that could be dug out of trash because our work then was secret. It wasn't highly confidential. It was really secret. Now, at that uh, point, I uh, was still living with my parents. I could not tell my parents what I did. That infuriated my mother and father, especially my father. He was a uh, uh, general foreman at the local General Motors plant in Trenton. So he understood industry. He had, he couldn't fathom what it was that I was doing. It bothered him that it was secret and that I just couldn't tell him. My own parents. Okay, let's go to the rockets. The machine that made this shape is this. It is fed by a mechanical computer. There were no electric computers. The resin, the fiberglass resin, the resin was a biphenyl epoxy. We were the first ones to use that in a production mode, except we couldn't tell anybody what we were making. All right? And the computer couldn't be electronic even if it was available because the fumes from the biphenyl resin would coat circuit boards, uh, solenoids, everything else, and make them uh, inoperable. Don Ross, the project engineer that I worked for, built this computer. And it's mechanical. It's full of gears and clutches because gears, as they mesh together with different ratios, add, subtract, multiply, and divide. And if you put a planetary set around a common gear, it takes you up to a, a uh, mathematical power. All right, La La Land doesn't do it justice. And all I did was shake my head and said, yeah, I knew that, yeah, I knew that. Okay, so we built these machines. And my first job was to make a cradle to take this engine off of this machine and take it to another building. Okay. Why fiberglass? We're talking about rocket engines. Let me take you back and tell you about the rocket program in 1959. The Russians in 1957 launched Sputnik. They had an aluminum ball about the size of a beach of a, of a medicine ball with a bunch of antennas that weighed 135 pounds. But they did not have any electronic expertise whatsoever. All they knew was brute force. So the Russians took the V-2 rocket that was built by the scientists, some of which they captured. They took five of those and put them in a circle around a main booster. Their rocket was so powerful, they could launch our entire three-stage rocket that we ended up developing. That's how they got Sputnik into space. Okay, so the U.S. is, in 1958, Eisenhower, President Eisenhower, is yelling at NASA and the Air Force and uh, any, the scientific community, get a satellite up. And we're now in 58, it's one year later. So they took a V-2 rocket. We had captured 300 from Germany after World War II, that's another story, and brought them to the United States. We still had some left. Now from 1945 to 1958, they were still launching these 300 V-2s, now called the A-2. So nobody would think that we're using Nazi material. We were. All right. So they made a three-stage rocket. 
the V2 was the first stage. And the f job of the first stage, they're piled, they're stacked on top of one another. Every rocket you've seen and all the launches since then, including Gemini, uh, Apollo, uh, 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 Saturn, there were all three stage rockets. The first stage is the booster. It's a monster. Its job is to get everything off the ground. We only had a single rocket of three stages, three stages. The Russians, their first stage had five rockets just to lift the load. What does that mean? We came up with a satellite, not 135 pounds like the Russians, 36 pounds, the size of a soccer ball. Its job of this monster rocket that we had was to get it off the ground. First stage, the booster, takes all this and gets it off the pad. That's why when you see it being launched, it moves so slowly. All right, so it gets off the ground. The second stage fires, the first stage drops off, the second stage fires, and starts pushing it up towards an orbit. But it can't get all the way into orbit because the third stage and the second stage are liquid fuel. And you cannot take liquids out of gravity's hold because the fluids in the tanks don't go where you want it. And the engines do all kinds of crazy things. So the third stage, the last stage, the sustainer stage, the orbit injection stage, whatever name you want to apply to it, uh, has to be solid propellant. And the only materials we had was steel, stainless steel, and aluminum. Well, you can't use steel and stainless steel because it was so heavy it would just drop back to earth. It wouldn't go anywhere. The engine would have to be the size of maybe the second stage or third stage. Anyway, it doesn't work. In 1957, in New Jersey at Long Branch, there was a team of engineers who had invented filament wound fiberglass. Fiberglass, fiberglass, not aluminum, not steel, no titanium, didn't have it yet. No beryllium, didn't have it yet. We had door aluminum or aluminum. That was it. Okay. If you look at the early launches from 1958, you would see the three stages fire, or just the two stages of the rocket fire. First stage, second stage. The third stage, suddenly there's a big light and it goes sideways. The side of the rocket split. Not ours, but this would be the engine. If it's made of aluminum, the side would split and the rocket would go that way. Okay, or that way, whichever the split side the split was on. And that happened to five rockets. Now, folks, in 1958, NASA is one year old. One year old. And you've got these crazy guys in New Jersey who went to them and said, we have a fiberglass engine that will not split. And NASA literally told us, you're nuts. All right, go away, go away, go away. And we went away. How is this possible? When you make a fiberglass structure, like this. These, resin, these yarns of resin are in all directions. And fiberglass, fiberglass is extremely strong in tension. When you add resin to it, they stick together. And these are, I exaggerate it, showing how far apart they are. They're actually right next to one another. Uh, so you've got thousands of lays, which is what they call this, of, of uh, fiberglass in this shape, all right? We made this out of fiberglass. The fiberglass was non-metallic. We would pre-stretch it by pumping water into each engine at 5,000 PSI air. What does that mean? I'll describe it a little later. Water is not compressible. So we would mount this 
in a fixture, pump water into the finished engine, pump water into it with 5,000 PSI, pounds per square inch of air behind it, and that would stretch the fiberglass. Once stretched, the second time when you put a propellant in it and fire it, it would stretch and then come back to shape, not tear. We never had a fiberglass failure that, that got out the door. The NASA came to us one day, I, I only heard the story third hand, and they apparently came to us, uh, or we went to there, I don't, I don't know, any, I don't remember what the story was. But the people at NASA said, uh, do you guys, you guys still have that, that fiberglass thing? And does it work? We said, yeah, it works. And the natural question was, well, how do you know it works? Because we made small versions of this in Long Branch, New Jersey, we dug a, we went to the beach and dug a trough in the, in the sand, laid the engine with propellant in it, and fired it across Raritan Bay, the bay, Long Beach Bay, all right? Now, dumb, it worked. Now, we could also then take a motorboat out afterward, after we saw it hit, come back and then pull it back because it floated. Not only does it float, but the heat of the engine firing the propellant inside the rocket, inside this part, makes the resin post-cure. So it's actually stronger than when you fired the rocket. So you got three things going for you. It won't break, it'll take the heat, and it floats. All right. NASA absolutely went ballistic. They told us in no uncertain terms that we were nuts, but they had no choice. Why? We had, they had launched three rockets without a satellite. And when the third stage fired, the side split and it went sideways. Failure. They got desperate, and I never have understood why, on the fourth rocket, they put an Explorer satellite, that was our first satellite, actually in the third stage. Fired it, same thing, the sides of the rocket motor split, and they put satellite, very expensive, into the Atlantic Ocean. Things were getting desperate, and Eisenhower, President Eisenhower was telling them, that now we're into 1959, and he's saying, I want a rocket I want a satellite, a U.S. satellite, up there. I'm tired of hearing the beep, beep, beep from Sputnik go overhead. So, okay. So they launched the fifth rocket. Engine split. It goes sideways, dumped in another sat satellite into the ocean. Then the sixth one had our rocket engine on it. And this pretty much, this is pretty close to what it was. It has a payload a rocket cone on the front, the engine, and all this fits in to a, a third stage. All this fits into a third stage. Has a nozzle on the end. We fired this, and we, voila, got our first satellite in orbit. So we were a success. Every one of these had to be pressure tested, and we pressure tested it by pumping water with 5,000 pounds of air behind it, pumping water into this and the uh, finish state to expand the fiberglass with what little stretch it had. And the reason is, once you pre-stretch fiberglass, there's no cracks, nothing gives, but the second time when you actually put propellant in it and fire it, it's not going to go anywhere. It's not going to blow up. It's not going to tear. And every one of these had to be 100% tested. Zero defects. Except we, the word wasn't invented yet, zero defects. So we took this engine and we put a aluminum pl a plate about three inches thick on this end where it says inner stage connector and put that up like this. And we stood this on 10 feet of concrete 
through which we ran a water pipe up through the bottom. Everybody taking notes? Up through the bottom, and we would pressurize it. Well, how did you hold it? Ah, we had clamps, huge clamps, anchored to the concrete that would grab this ring here and hold it down. Then we pumped water in through the bottom. But what did we use? I'm glad you asked. We had an early RV two-car garage, prefabricated, that we had on a concrete pad. The same concrete pan, 10 foot thick, deep. The concrete people in Rocky Hill just loved us. And uh, the RV doors were twice as high and about half again as wide as a normal garage door. And I had two of these doors. And that's so we can move engines out and process them in a process. Every engine had to be tested, as I said. And this test shack that we built, which is what we called it, had to operate 24-7 because we were just, we were running three shifts and just making these engines um, at night and day. The test shack had a flak shack that we bought from a local demolition company. And it, it was used somewhere in the storing of concrete. But it had walls, I guess about 10 inches to a foot thick, and it was made of a weird material that would absorb shrapnel. Get the idea? Okay. So we, uh, inside this flak shack, we would keep the air compressor, and we had a water tank outside because the water was consumed. It wasn't reused. Yeah, it wasn't reusable. We would just dump it outside. One night, it was a Friday, and I think it was either late fall. I think it was late fall, uh, late spring, late spring. And uh, on a Friday night at 8 p.m., we launched a rocket, folks. Now, no propellant, but you put 5,000 pounds of pressure behind anything, wet oatmeal, jello, and something's gonna go somewhere. And uh, 8 o'clock at night, all the lights in Rocky Hill went out. Okay. And there was a soft concussion. Now, a soft concussion is not like an artillery shell going off or a bomb. That's a hard concussion. That hits you, knocks you down, knocks all the breath out of you, stuff flies off of, uh, off of shelves, uh, off of tables, tables take off, windows shatter. Uh, that's a hard concussion. This was a soft concussion. But still, we knew that something was wrong. We had a third, a second shift on, and the uh, night, uh, the second shift foreman said, goodness gracious, what the heck was that, or words to that effect? And uh, one of the workers said, well, I don't know. He said, well, look outside. Yeah, oh, it's a good idea. So he opened the door, and he says, there's nothing out there. Closed the door. The foreman said to the worker, what do you mean, nothing? Where's the f shack, the test shack? And the guy said, oh, opened the door again. And now, folks, everything is coming down. What had happened? When all the clamps broke, they sequentially broke, the rocket took off until it broke all the restraining lines, pipes, whatever. And when it went up, it took the roof with it, took the roof right off the building. The doors were partially open, but the pressure from the soft concussion pushed the doors out. Remember that. I'm going to tell you something about that. Push that out. It blew the operator back and broke his leg. And his right leg, heel, his right heel, hit him in the back of the head. At least that's the story I got. Uh, he wasn't killed, but he was severely injured. All right, now, 
the next, I was part of the accident investigation uh, group, and when I went out in the field behind the plant where the test shack used to be, uh, there was virtually nothing left except a flak shack. The flak shack made it through intact. Holes uh, uh, made in the, out in the exterior where various things hit it. But I found these steel rods, and one was 120 foot long. Do you remember in your time when the overhead doors used to have a coil spring that ran the whole length almost of the garage? That was one of the coil springs that held the double-sized doors that acted like a sail as they moved out because of air pressure. It straightened the spring out. In uh, the end of 1960, I was asked to look at uh, transferring to two different places, one of which was the loading area, which this is the loading area. And this is in Cumberland Gap, New Jer uh, uh, Maryland. Cumberland Gap, Maryland. This was put, the engine was put upside down in a loading pit, and I'd exaggerated the size of the engine, the size of the pit, so you can see what I'm talking about. And they had a plastic funnel, and yes, we used a cement mixer to mix the rocket propellant, but it had to be mixed, and then poured in a jelly-like substance into the rocket engine. Now, folks, no one was allowed out here. Electronics didn't exist then. So everything was powered by solenoids and sequenced. And I don't mean, I, I, I never did see the, the, opera, the operation and uh, because that was a different security clearance, but they would push a sequence of buttons to start the mixer, drop the chute, feed the material into the rocket engine. Now folks, it's not a bomb until you encase it. It's like TNT. TNT, the actual material itself, the boom boom material, you can hit with a hammer, you can cut with a knife, and it's not dangerous, as long as it's in jelly or fluid form. As soon as you encapsulate it, you have a stick of dynamite and a spark or a hammer hit will set it off and you know the results. This is the same thing. I uh, was sent out here to interview working there and everything was okay, kind of, sort of, until my guide told me about the day that one of these ignited. After mixing and after curing, something set it off and they blew a cement mixer a quarter mile. And that was an engine that was 30 inches in diameter, 60 inches high. The object is to make a solid propellant rocket. Now, it looks like that. Now, the object is For this propellant to replace the liquid fuel of the booster and the second stage of a normal three-stage rocket. The last stage, because of gravity, has to be solid propellant. It's a big bottle rocket, all right, big bottle rocket. And we have to generate a shape on the inside like this, and that's pretty close to what it really looked like at the time. I can't tell you it was how hyper secret it was, all right? The object here is to make the surface of this inner shape the same area as the outside diameter here. This green is the rocket case. It has a rubber liner, and I'll tell you why in a minute, and then the propellant, and then we're gonna generate a shape in the inside with the area being the same of this inner shape and the outside diameter stabilizes the rocket when it's fired so that we don't blow up the case, number one. Number two, it burns the same shape until it looks like this. 
This is what it looks like when it's consumed. And the object is so that there's no speeding up or slowing down of the rocket, because this is a rocket that's going to take us into space. That's why it's called a sustainer engine, the third stage, or the orbit injection. And the orbit injection engine is the correct term of its purpose. Now, how do we get that shape? To put that shape into the rocket, we have to push a polished steel device that is called a ram, and this is what it looks like. We got to push it with a hydraulic cylinder into the poured cast propellant of the inside of the engine. This is what the process looks like. This time, we have a concrete wall, 25 foot thick, and it goes into the ground a 10 foot deep, and it has an op uh, operator room on the other side of it, obviously, and the engine butts up against that concrete. We hydraulically push that ram into the propellant, and it pushes and forms the shape cold. That is, until, and this is the real, beside the, the fact that they blew a cement mixer a quarter mile, this is the real reason I didn't take this job to this particular place. If there is a bubble inside of the engine, inside the propellant that's inside the engine, if there's a bubble, you can't see it. You don't know what's there, because this stuff x-rays like gray matter. It, 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 you just can't have definition. So we couldn't x-ray it to see if the core was voidless. All right. Now, the problem is, if the ram hit a bubble, it would speed up and go into the back side of the bubble and buffle, ignite the engine. They blew, the 25 feet of concrete ain't going nowhere, but it blew the ram and the whole hydraulic unit and the cylinder a mile when it uh, went. It also blew the ob observation shack off its foundation. That was the first place. Uh, needless to say, I said no. All right. The second place was a rocket design group of nine of us who would work on space projects and uses, new uses for our engine, solely our engine, the filament wound fiberglass engine. And this was hidden in Wilmington, Delaware, on, in a bank building on top of a bank vault. The reason was so nobody could physically get to us from the bottom. We had our own elevator with a special guard who took us up to the room. We did our thing and went home. That was exciting work. How exciting. In, nine, in uh, November of 1960, we had a suit come into the room. A suit was a person who didn't look like us. They were dressed in, uh, in a suit. And uh, our, our uh, uh, leader, our group leader, told us to cover all our work when that happened and uh, just listen. And the guy, uh, the suit, told us, he said, uh, I'm here to brief you on something that's happened and I want you to get the straight scoop on what happened, so we uh, uh, feel that you're privileged enough to hear it. In November 1960, the Russians lost two cosmonauts, and in re-entry to the atmosphere, they actually came in at too flat an angle, and they bounced off the atmosphere, and folks, they're still out there. That was the best job I ever had in my life. However, <clears throat> Wilmington uh, was not an area that we, uh, I was newly married 
in the summer of 1960, and we looked through Wilmington, and it wasn't a place that we really wanted to move to. And the security uh, was really getting to me because I couldn't even tell my wife what, what I did. And she had difficulty telling her relatives what her new husband uh, did for a living. And uh, so, folks, that was it. All right. I uh, took a job at a company in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, not far from Wilmington, not far from Trenton, my hometown. And the company was uh, a carbon graphite company. And the really odd thing was I was hired to work on uh, high temperature resistant materials and that were carbon graphite which has no temperature, uh, maximum temperature, because it doesn't melt. It doesn't change state. It doesn't change shape. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't do anything. It just takes the heat. And uh, we're also dealing with ceramics and making devices for use in the steel industry. We, uh, while I was there, and I was still an engineer in training, and I was uh, trying to get my professional engineer's license, I worked for a young uh, for a gentleman by the name of Bob Silver, and the product that he invented still bears his name. It's called the Bob the Silver Lance, and it's named for him. All right, this gentleman was extremely well versed in super high uh, temperature material resistant materials, and I'm talking about uh, from a minimum of thousand degrees to twenty to actually 3,000 degrees. Steel melts at 2,800 degrees Fahrenheit, aluminum melts at 1,200. And we were making devices to be used in the molten metals as they're being made. One day, we got a uh, inquiry uh, from somewhere, I didn't see the inquiry, but it was for a liner for a rocket nozzle. And this was very, very interesting. My boss came to me and said, um, you were in rockets. He said, what do you know about rocket nozzles? And I said, well, I know that they have a carbon graphite liner. And uh, he said, is, is there any money in it? Uh, well, that's not for me to decide. Uh, I'll tell you what I know about it, and you make that decision. Next thing I know, a bunch of government officials from the Navy Yard in uh, Philadelphia are in our plant and are checking us out and uh, talking about rocket nozzles. And apparently they're talking about rocket nozzles that are very small in diameter that are used in the retro rockets around a man capsule soon to be. This is 63, 1963. The man space program is starting. In fact, John Glenn made his first orbital flight, the first man to go into orbit around the Earth in 1963. They were having trouble with uh, rocket nozzles, and the nozzle is the other end of the engine, right here. If you cut one in half, that's what it looks like. It has an aluminum outer shell, and the inner is a Bernoulli's effect Venturi, that was machined out of carbon graphite. These were huge. These were about 14 inches long, 14 inches in diameter. We cut it out of a solid block. We built a new plant in 19, and went into it in 1963. So everything was going our way. Nobody else, almost nobody else, wanted to make rocket nozzle liners because you've got to machine away so much material. The operator of the lathe that they make these on actually would disappear in a cloud of black yuck, all right? Even with a dust collector system. And we, the reason for building the plant, we had to have a huge dust collector system, all right? So they sent me to a place, a secret place, and a secret again, in Aberdeen, uh, Maryland and they were the nozzle experts. 
They made rocket nozzles from 14 inch by 14 inch, 14 inch diameter, 14 inches long. These are just aligners. And the retro rocket, which is very small, and in fact, about that big around. If you make the high sign, it'll fit in the sign of your th index finger and your thumb. So all kinds. The Navy was desperate to get them, and I still don't know to this day why the Navy was involved. We made these rocket nozzles, liners, at a really profitable margin because we're the only ones that was not afraid of getting dirty and we had the machinery to do it and we built a our first inspection system and we would inspect these. Now the crazy thing was carbon graphite is black. My interviewers were interviewers wearing a very black shirt and it's blacker than black. And uh, carbon graphite doesn't reflect light. So you couldn't put a bore scope into it. So I got a, uh, uh, a, uh, a, a device that was a split screen and uh, we would have to cut a nozzle in half, exactly in half, and bounce light off of it and onto this screen and uh, make our measurements visually. We were willing to make the investment and we're willing to do this. Now folks, I'm talking about a period when I started from April of 1959 to September of 1968. And I got out of the rocket business and I was hired by a company in Fort Wayne, Indiana that wanted my a material that I had developed of carbon graphite in filled Teflon. That was a lubrication free piston ring for lubri lubrication free air compressors. Uh, people that use uh, medical equipment have these, people that use airbrushes have these, and the compressors aboard ships, uh, depending on their cargo, have lubrication free, no oil, no gasoline, lubrication free uh, piston rings. Anyway, I had developed the material for that and the f company in Fort Wayne wanted that process, so they hired me and brought me here. Do I miss the rocket business? Yeah. I, but I've lost too much ground in the time that I've been away to go back to it. Would I go back to it? Yes. And for it, as the son of immigrant grandparents, the grandson of immigrant grandparents, graduating second from the bottom of my class, uh, I'm really happy that I was able to get into the industry at its beginning, live through its history that I did. Thank you.